Someone in my circle of friends alerted me to Mr. Mizrak's new book, Destroy This Memory, on the Internet. The house with that message on the book's cover was my brother's house on Legend Drive in the Storybook Park subdivision in Mayro, Louisiana. My brother, Stephen, lived there for almost 18 years with his wife and son before Katrina and the flood. He wrote that message on the brick face of his house during one of his visits back to St. Bernard after he signed the authorization papers for the government to have the house torn down since it was beyond repair. He and his family now live on the north shore of Louisiana in the Covington Mandeville area. Like many, or maybe all of us in some way, Steve has suffered from depression sorry, and has had, had problems dealing with the sudden change of rebuilding his life, quite literally, due to the devastation of Hurricane Katrina. Everyone in our immediate family, three brothers, my sister and father, and myself, all lost our homes and nearly all of our belongings. Some of us had only three and a half, had three and a half feet of water and could save some items stored high. Um, water in Steve's house went well above the roof. The hardest part for everyone is that Katrina we, we all lived th within, sorry. The hardest part for everyone is that before Katrina, we, we all lived within a 10 to 15 minute drive from one another. Now our parents live with me in Baton Rouge. One brother built my old house in Chamette, and Steve and my youngest brother live on the North Shore. So some of us are now at least 60 miles away from each other. Phones and emails are great, but it's not the same thing as seeing your loved ones face to face. Things you can, re things you can replace, but the devastation torn about communities and separated tight family units forever. Anyway, that was a, a note from Brenda Kelt, and I thought it was uh, really powerful. And on that note, I'd love to take your questions, if you have any. No? All right, then. Oh, there we go. Uh, yeah, the, the question was is um, that I shot other work besides this, and uh, the 8x10 the work um, was not, it was very different than this, actually. And it, yes, it was more of the destruction. Um, and you'll just have to wait till I, I release it. Um, basically, uh, the plan is, is on the five-year anniversary was to release this work. On the 10-year anniversary, I'm doing a four-channel, 1,000-image um, slide projection installation. And then on the 20-year anniversary, the idea was just to release the big ones. Um, I'm printing those now because in case I'm not around um, at that point, I'm older than I was before. But, um, um, but I may release uh, some of those um, in, in the near, near future also. Yes. Uh, a man with a rifle. Oh, there's a photograph of a man with a rifle, and I was just wondering if you could tell us a little bit more about it. Yeah. Pointing it at, at, oh. at another person. Sorry. Pointing the rifle at another person. Yeah. So one of the early photographs I I, I showed was um, a man pointing a rifle at another man, and the, the smoky environment. This was part of the Desert Fire series that I did. And these guys come out there, and rabbits come out of these burns, and they, they shoot the rabbits. Um, but uh, when I saw them sort of pointing at the field, if you look really carefully, you could see that the two guys are in different planes. But the illusion is, and it's a great illusion of photography, is that there, he was actually shooting the guy, but he wasn't. Um, and so uh, when he, t he turned and saw me f photographing them, the guy who was being shot uh, smiled, and, and I, I snapped the shutter at that point. Yes. Sure. Um, that's that's a good question. Um, up until about two years ago, I, I shot exclusively eight by ten. Um, I haven't shot film in the last two years. I've been shooting digital, um, basically a Hasselblad and a and a, a phase back, a large digital back. The quality has improved so much, and the, the advantages of shooting. Um, digital now are so amazing that it, it's really hard to, to, to go back. Sure. 
Okay, let me answer that one, then I'll, I'll get to the second one. So the question is, what happened to those dead animals? Um, basically, those are mass graves, um, like trash dumps in Nevada desert. Those, those animals, the, the nuclear tests that happened in that area, and there were nuclear tests in that part of Nevada, Nevada in the 1950s. So uh, those animals have not died from that. Um, there had been rumored to, to, like that the environment somewhat toxic and things like that, but it's not like it was uh, the event, you know, a specific event. Um, some of them are pets. Some of them are actually um, uh, animals that were used by the military for testing and studying. That I, that I did was able to find out. Um, uh, and they had a policy for years where, like a trash dump, they would bring their animals and um, bulldozers would carve out a big area. The animals would be dumped over a period of a week. Then a bulldozer would come, bury it, and then carve another one. And it would do this sort of cycle all the way around for years and years and years. Um, and then, um, but it wasn't healthy and it wasn't right. A after the photographs were released, the EPA actually closed that place down. And um, second question. The second question is, I thought it was, you know, interesting that you chose, maybe if there was a reason, logistical reason, that you showed the images on slides instead on a, like tonight, instead of on a, let's digital say, PowerPoint or digital, and whether there was a specific reason for that. And also... I, you know, I followed some of your works for over the years and saw your last show in Chelsea, which was quite different yeah. and, you know, a very different. It was a pattern. It was just a textural landscape in a if different way. Right, and right. if you can talk about, you know, uh, work between the new work that you're doing right. and then this type of still continuing a sort of a social kind of a dialogue kind of work. Sure. So, sorry, what was the first part of that? Those two parts, sorry. The slide projector oh, yeah. was, it was surprising, I guess. Yeah, yeah so um, uh, the question was, why do, why do I still um, use a slide projector? It's sort of um, obsolete in theory, but uh, the few times I tried PowerPoint, the quality just sucks. It's just so bad. And um, so I'm still, I still prefer slides. I just think they look better. They, they're a little clearer. Um, sorry? Well, you can archive them as a slide, but you could also digitally archive them. But um, um, and yeah, I, I'm not sure which would last longer, actually. But but mostly, I just like the way they look better. I think they read more closely to the photographs. Also, from what I understand, everybody that I know that does PowerPoint, they never start fumbling, and it gets it gets they have problems, you know, in, during the process. Um, the second question was is uh, basically I think why this work is so different than what I just showed in Chelsea. There's a couple answers to that. One, um, uh, the work in Chelsea is a newer work. This work was shot uh, five years ago. Um, and I feel this is part of an ongoing interest that I have that, that hasn't changed. Um, and I've been, you know, I've been working for 40 years, so I, I have a lot of interest. I, and I like the fact that I... I um, John Cage wrote something about 40 years ago that I've thought about always, which is you take an idea, you work it as far as you can do, and then go, and then you drop like a pair of dirty socks. And I just, that's stuck with me. And uh, so a lot of that work that I showed earlier this year, which I'm still very much working on, and I'll probably do a book probably in about a year or two from now because uh, I'm not quite finished with it. Um, and I love that work. But it's sort of a radical departure where I just push myself. And um, I've gone back. I now, uh, you know, shoot digital. I'm printing everything myself again, which I didn't use, you know, I hadn't done for 25, 30 years. Um, and it, 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 uh, it encourages one to experiment and play, and it's which is I've just been having a ball doing that for the last several years. So, um, and and part of my work has always been um, along two polar extremes. One is um, social and political interests, and just a passion for photography, the medium itself. I mean, I just think the medium itself is so beautiful. So, a lot of times my work will shift from one end and just explore the beauty of the medium, and then come back to using it in a more functional, ut utilitarian way. And someday um, the two might sort of come together, but they, they, never, they never really fit together. So that tension is always, um, I don't know, kept my work vital, you know, um, active for me. To, and it keeps my interest in it. Yes. Hi. Right. Uh, the question was, is um, when I was photographing the, in Katrina, uh, I must have run into people. 
when when I was photographing their homes and things like that. No, there were no people there. Um, for six weeks, I didn't see another human being the whole time. No, no, I never saw a single person. Uh, I, I saw three National Guardsmen at one point, um, but uh, you know they were. And and this was a. Um, I photographed the Oakland Fire, which is a similar landscape, but it's it's a small little area. This is this is a huge area from from Mississippi to New Orleans. Um, you know, there was nobody there, and and, and certain areas were actually still uh, uh, cordoned off and just. And I, I went in with a press pass actually, but. Um, but no, I, n I never saw another person. And so, no, there are no pictures. I, d I did one 8x10 portrait, a big one, which is I'm printing 8x10 feet of the three National Guardsmen with, you know, with the thing. It's, it's just a portrait with, of those guys. And that, that's my only pictures of people. Uh, yes, and then, yes, go ahead. Go ahead. During your time down there, um, you, you talk about a lot of the things that were um, in common between, let's say, the Mississippi Gulf Coast and New Orleans. Um, besides the obvious, I would imagine there was more anger in the New Orleans area, although you did say you didn't see many people, um, because that so much more about New Orleans was human error. Did you notice any differences or have any observances, uh, observations of the, uh, the two different areas? Uh, actually, the anger, and most of it was that the... Uh, the question was, is, was there a difference in the anger level... Uh, of, from the Mississippi Gulf Coast, which is generally uh, the w wealthier community, although plenty of wealthy communities in, in New, or uh, New Orleans um, and Louisiana were hit as well. But, um, but no, the, I mean, there was tons of anger, uh, mostly towards the insurance companies. Um, that was really big. Um, I remember the, the, the first day on the Mississippi Gulf Coast, I mean, houses were just gone, you know, just, you know, just... Uh, and, and people were really frustrated, one after the other, because the insurance companies just were not... Not not uh, responding at all. They couldn't. They they were they were overextended, and they had to find ways to get out of it. I mean, otherwise they wouldn't have covered anybody. But uh, somebody, yes. Friend, um, I have a question about the format of the book. You mentioned kind of the urgency and the um, tightness of the wording and a lot of the messages and the photographs, and then the book is kind of this big more traditional format photo book and kind of how you came up to, to kind of bring the, and the photographs themselves as being taken with like, you know, a small camera taken quickly and kind of without a lot of like preparation and thought and then how that led to a sort of big traditional photo book instead of maybe a different format. Right. Um, well, w we explored a couple formats for the book. Um, I love the fact that the digital imagery was strong enough to hold that that pre that weight. I also felt that the book should have the gravitas of a serious uh, project, even though it was a low tech uh, sort of capture and that kind of thing. Um, I, uh, as I said before, the the Civil War photographs really meant a lot to me, and books mean a lot to me in the sense that they're around thirty, forty, fifty years. I wanted to make a book that uh, I felt this. I felt this very narrow body of work actually added a, a chapter to everything that had been seen by just having the voices of the people. And I felt like if I did a, a cheaper, we look, we, ex, we export some accordion books and smaller books and less expensive. And I think they would have been more just thrown away. So um, it was something that we, we went over, you know, didn't want to create a big artsy coffee table book. At the same time, I didn't want to create something that would, would not, you know, be worthy of what I, I felt the work and mostly, you know, that particular chapter of, of Katrina. Other question? Yeah. How prevalent were the uh, graffiti in the area? I mean, is it, was, was it every house or is it the occasional house on the street? How does it look like on, when you're walking around? Yeah, it, it wasn't every house. Um, every house had, uh, I don't know if you probably noticed um, uh, in the photographs, that there'd be like an X form. And that X form was a, uh, it's a, it's actually a quadrant that the rescue workers used. So when they would go to a house, they had a convention of creating an X, and the, in the top quadrant would be a number, like 913. That would be the date. So nine, you know, September 13. 